Hey everyone, welcome back to Leosophy. I got a new microphone, so it might take a little bit to get used to that last video. Man, I'm glad I got this new one. Um, gonna ask three questions. Gonna be a short video this time. Short videos tend to do better. Let's jump right in. Can you be vegan and eat mushrooms? They aren't plants. That's a good point. Um, yeah, vegans and vegetarians, the focus tends to be not eating, uh, for the case of vegetarians, not the flesh of animals. Uh, in any any kind of uh, product that causes the suffering and death of the animal, and then for uh, vegans, it's any animal product. Well, m fungi aren't plants, but they're also not animals, and they also don't have central nervous systems. So the the chief argument, I, I suppose, would center around that. Uh, in addition, most of the time when people eat fungi, they're actually eating the fruiting bodies and not the mycelium underneath. So it doesn't even harm the actual organism because the mycelium, the thin fibers that run under the soil, that's the real organism. The the mushroom, like if you're eating a button or a morel or a, a portobello, whatever, shiitake, you're eating the fruiting body, the reproductive tract of that organism. And if it's already released its spores, you're not harming that organism in any real conceivable way. Additionally, uh, the organism that people do eat, the, the whole thing, is usually um, monocellular, like uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's a fungus that's in everything. You're having a loaf of bread or a beer or whatever, it, it, it's in that. But generally speaking, I, I, I don't think the focus of veganism is only eating plants. It's not eating animals. Case in point, bacteria. You know, that's a different kingdom of life, but you know, it's impossible not to consume them, and in fact, in many cases, you want to, because you want the, the living cultures to inhabit your GI tract. So, uh, in summation, yeah, mushrooms are not plants, but they're, they're also not uh, animals, and, and therefore I don't see any hypocrisy in, in vegans consuming them. I mean, you could argue that some of the behavior of mycelium is indicative of intelligence and maybe even consciousness, but as I've said in a previous video, the same thing could be said for plants regarding chemical signals and other things like that, so I'm not really all that concerned about it. I, I, don't, I don't see any hypocrisy there. I, they, it doesn't mean they have to eat plants. They're, they're, despite the name, the, the basis of that uh, dietary restriction is abstaining from animals rather than uh, and in the case of vegetarians, of course, they can even have animal products, provided the animal doesn't suffer. Let's see. What video game is the most replayable? Well, replayability is largely a question of the experience changing every time. So you don't want something that, uh, that has like a really obvious linear path. You know, most of the uh, solo campaign games are not very replayable. First-person shooters online are very replayable. The games that you see on uh, cell phones, the, the Skinner boxes, as I mentioned before, uh, which is a mean term for them, but it's, I think it's a very valid term for them, uh, like Candy Crush, Tetris, um, Angry Birds, things like that, that's going to be very replayable. For me personally, like I'd say my big addiction, actually it's not even, uh, it's not a question, uh, hands down, uh, The Binding of Isaac. It's like this morbid, roguelike uh, Legend of Zelda super messed up, really dark, but because of the different items and the way that they're used and because of the procedurally generated uh, dungeon rooms, every experience is different, and I've put more hours into that game than any other game, hands down. Maybe maybe most of the games I've played combined. It's ridiculous, and that tends to be a, a pattern I've noticed. People who play Binding of Isaac, that's, they don't just play, you know, oh, I, I logged 30 hours, and I was like, oh, I logged 700 hours. It's crazy. Um, okay, moving on. Is trypophobia real? I heard that it is fake. Uh, you asked the right person because I absolutely think it's real and I absolutely think I have it. Um, trypophobia, well, the reason why a lot of people thought it was fake originally is, one, it didn't really manifest, uh, socially until the advent of the internet, and two, it doesn't conform to what most people think of when they think of a phobia. Generally speaking, when somebody thinks of a phobia, they're talking about a fear response. That's what a phobia is, right? Well, it also is applicable to disgust response. And unfortunately, that, that I, I don't think trypophobia is a phobia in that sense because it's something that I think everybody has on some level. It's just a question of uh, sensitivity to pattern recognition. And I'll explain this. Um, 
For example, if somebody is afraid of cats, it would be called something like felinophobia or something like that. I'm not really sure what the what the proper term would be. And that's because it's unusual. It's like, why is that evoking a, a fear response? Usually it would be trauma or something, something unusual about that person. That's what makes a phobia a phobia, is that it stands out. Well, nobody would say, oh, you're afraid of gore. Everyone's disgusted by, by gore, generally speaking. You know, there's something kind of wrong if you're not. If you see somebody explode and their organs go everywhere, yeah, you should feel fear and disgust upon seeing that. So it's not a phobia. Nobody would label it that. Well, trypophobia, I think, is a pattern recognition that is associated with parasitism. So, for example, most people are disgusted by bot flies, and, well, by the larva wriggling in a human uh, body, or an animal body for that matter. People are disgusted by the... Uh, by parasit parasites in general, there's an entire there's a series of shows on Animal Planet just to disgust people because parasites gross humans out, and with good reason. We instinctively are going to be repulsed by things that lower our fitness. Fitness, by that I mean our our health, our means of living and reproducing. Anything that curtails that is considered bad, and and any animal is going to instinctively be uh, drawn away from things that do that. Anything that negates fitness, and parasites absolutely do. They're bad. They kill people. It's not something that you want. Well, trypophobia, I think, is just that some people are sensitive to those patterns to such a point that when they see asymmetrical openings, especially if you can see something kind of at the bottom of it, like the center of a lotus pod, they're very similar in terms of uh, aesthetics to somebody with actual wriggling parasites in their flesh. So that's where that comes from. And the reason why this wasn't documented before, the reason why it seems fake, is because until the internet and until massive stockpiles of images that you can just access at any time, it wasn't something that really came up. You know, not too many people, hey, Bob, I, I, uh, I just noticed uh, those frogs that have the babies on their back, they really gross me out. That's not like a common thing. But because images like that are everywhere online now, you can you can have a conversation about it and people can bring it up. It's not a fear response. It's simply disgust at something that aesthetically resembles something negative. Uh, similar example, you know, you see uh, the Snickers bar scene in, uh, was it Caddyshack? There's a scene where a Snickers bar is mistaken for human excrement. When you first see it, you're grossed out. And everybody in the film is grossed out when they see, you know, uh, Bill Murray's character take a bite of it. But it's actually a Snickers bar. Nobody's disgusted by Snickers bars, but if it's mistaken for something else, it, it will evoke that response. Well, similarly, the pattern recognition of people with trypophobia, they recognize those patterns, those shapes, as being reminiscent, at least on a primitive like reptile brain level, of being parasitic in nature. And I think it's actually uh, more common than people are willing to admit. And it, it, you could actually draw a parallel with that in... Uh, the, the behavior where people recognize objects as resembling a human face, you know, that's not something you'd hear in common conversation. You know, hey, Bob, that uh, light switch kind of looks like a smiling face. That's a weird thing to say, but it's something that a lot of people pick up on, it is, and it's similar. I think there's a connection there. I think if you're inclined to look at a car and think, oh, that looks kind of like a, a human face, the headlights are eyes, the bumper is a smile. Similarly, if you see a lotus pod, asymmetrical holes with uh, little tiny caps underneath that you can just barely see, your mind is going to make an association between that and holes in human flesh with the head capsules of parasitic larvae that you can just barely see. So that's that's what I think trypophobia is. I think it's absolutely real, and I, I actually don't think it's a phobia in the sense that I think it's actually totally normal response that uh, is being exaggerated by, by the fact that it just seems so outlandish. I, I think that that fear doesn't stem from trauma, doesn't stem from uh, any peculiar personality type. I think it's, uh, I think it's a case of normal instinct, and you just happen to be more sensitive to recognizing that particular pattern. Uh, yeah, that that answers all three questions. Uh, like and subscribe, and ask questions if you want. Uh, this is really fun. I'm having lots of fun doing this. Bye.